So last time we saw that uh, how the power is managed right, in several networks. Uh, so each participant uh, monitors its own signals to signal to noise or interference uh, ratio and has a certain target I think we denoted it by uh, what's it gamma uh, gamma i and uh, um, uh, he is uh, that um, Participants are not greedy, uh, rather than maximizing their signal to interference ratio, they try to maintain it as close to gamma i as possible, and uh, then things work out optimally for all the participants, right? Now, how do they monitor their uh, signal to interference ratio? Well. Uh, uh, signals are um, transmitted as a continuous waveform, but uh, the receiver samples uh, the received uh, uh, signal at instants that are that are synchronized with the um, sampling points that were used uh, to uh, reconstruct the discontinuous time. Uh, signal and uh, um, so each of the sample received is not exactly on the value that was sent but it is impacted by noise right but uh, if the distance between two symbols say this is one symbol um, and another symbol might have a different value here and for as long as the distance between the samples of uh, uh, any two signals are more than the RMS value of the noise, with high likelihood uh, the signal will be uh, correctly decoded. So once you decode the signal and you figure out that the closest to the noisy signal received the closest symbol that you have is a given one, then you can simply subtract the, the uh, received noise signal from the signal that uh, you know it has been sent, and you can estimate uh, <coughs> the, R, the RMS value of the noise. So, so locally, uh, given that you correctly decoded the signal, you can actually accurately estimate signal to interference ratio. And we saw in order <coughs> for this optimization problem to be feasible, gamma i's should not be too large, right? Uh, because uh, this, um, the matrix that we constructed last time, uh, the product of these two matrices uh, um, um, is uh, um, in order to have spectral radius, namely that all uh, eigenvalues be smaller than one, gamma i shouldn't be too large. But uh, now, how does the receiver know what is the what should the, the targeted value of the uh, gamma be? Right? How? What is the optimal value of, of gamma? And interestingly enough, the, another part, another important algorithm on its own right uh, provides these uh, values of gamma i, and namely that's the error correction coding. What is error correction coding? Uh, you see, for example, <coughs> if you, well, I guess they are almost gone now. If you, I wanted to say, if you listen to a CD uh, being played on your CD player, um, it's uh, you know you will always have some specks of dust uh, that will distort, that will uh, cause uh, some of the symbols to be, some of the values to be misread. 
Uh, similarly, in uh, telecommunications, even if you uh, keep the adjacent symbols uh, farther apart than the uh, some multiple, say, of the RMS value of the error, because the error is, uh, the noise is inherently stochastic. Uh, every now and then, uh, you will, in fact, uh, uh, decode uh, the wrong uh, symbol. So errors are inevitable. But uh, for successful communications, we need uh, essentially perfect or almost perfect transmission of information. So how can this be resolved? Uh, well, a trivial option would be to send uh, uh, every packet three times uh, and then take voting on all the bits on the packet. And if it's uh, unlikely that uh, uh, two bits uh, will be, the same two bits will be altered uh, by the noise, uh, then with a high probability, uh, you can conclude that if the three bits are different, uh, you take always the majority um, uh, vote for among these three copies, right? But that is terribly wasteful, right? Because this would reduce the throughput of your channel to um, uh, just one third of the total throughput. Uh, um, by the way, error correction is used not only in telecommunications, but also for uh, digital storage, right? If you have, uh, um, uh, you know, hard drives, what they say, every hard drive either has failed or will fail, uh, or will fail, right? Because uh, uh, they involve mechanical uh, parts and uh, the plates rotate at high speed and uh, every now and then they uh, crash. And so how do you prevent, prevent the loss of information? And again, uh, having multiple copies is uh, prohibitively expensive. It will uh, vastly increase the storage requirements. So uh, what uh, this uh, RAID system does, it actually uses error correction codes that allow the system of, say, uh, seven hard drives. Uh, if uh, any of them fails, uh, you can just replace it with a blank hard drive, and the system can perfectly recover the entire, the whole information, and uh, rewrite, uh, re you know, write again uh, this uh, information to the new blank uh, drive. So we want to see how, what's the trick behind uh, this process. And the idea is actually, well, a remarkable, a remarkably simple, but it was quite difficult to implement uh, until fairly recently, I believe, until early 80s. Um, so, idea is, uh, assume that I have, say, 10 values, uh, um, A0, A1, up to A9, that I want to transmit, right? Well, instead of transmitting these 10 values, I do the following trick. I form a polynomial whose coefficients are precisely the values that I want to transmit. So I form the polynomial p of x equals a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared plus and so forth plus uh, plus a9x uh, to the uh, to the 9 power. And then what I do, I transmit uh, I transmit uh, altogether uh, 12 values uh, of this polynomial. Any, uh, any of them would do the trick, say, 
I can transmit, you remember, from 3.1 to 1, uh, the whole business about polynomial evaluation will come pretty uh, handy now. So I transmit the values, say, P of 0, P of 1, up to P of 11. Right? Of course, what we could have done, we could have transmitted the values, say, from minus 5 to uh, how many? 6, uh, which will be uh, of smaller size, but let's ignore this at the moment. So I transmit these 12 values. So I have 10 pieces of information, 10 numbers to transmit, but I actually transmit 12 uh, values uh, that are uh, values of this polynomial with the coefficients that are the values that I want to transmit, uh, right? And now we are going to show that uh, uh, if uh, one of uh, these uh, 12 values uh, uh, gets corrupt uh, or transmitted uh, <coughs> incorrectly, Uh, we can uh, decode the coefficients uh, a0 to an perfectly, right? How is this done? This is done in a very simple manner, right? Out of these 12 values, right? Out of these uh, 12 values, you try choosing uh, any 11 values and you uh, set one value on, on the side. From these 11 values, you choose arbitrary 10 and you put uh, uh, and you construct a polynomial that has precisely these 10 values. So this requires a little detour. So assume that uh, uh, let's call these values B0, B1, uh, B11. So say if I have values B0 to B9, so that's arbitrary 10 values that I pick, how would I construct a polynomial through these points? Uh, well, this is a very old trick due to Lagrange. This is called Lagrange interpolation polynomial. This polynomial, let's call it uh, Q of X, is the following polynomial. It will be sum of the following uh, polynomials. Here uh, you have on top a uh, product of the factors uh, X minus bi, and here you have bi, a product of b, uh, b, uh, b, uh, say, uh, j minus bi. So the product here is uh, for all i not equal to j, and here for all i not equal to j, and here you have the value, oh, so I'm sorry, I am messing it up colossally. So here we will have the values just i, right? And here we will have difference uh, j minus i, and here we have the value uh, b uh, j. So this guy on top, right, will have altogether uh, uh, nine products, right? So because we know that these guys are uh, the values at uh, uh, from zero to eleven. So i or j, j will range from. Uh, 
zero, sorry, in this case we go only up to uh, up to nothing. Right? What is the idea? Uh, if I substitute, uh, what is the value of uh, this polynomial? Uh, uh, what is the value of this polynomial? Well, the trick is, uh, you see, if you consider just polynomials uh, x minus 0 times x minus 1 and then x minus j minus 1 and then x minus j plus 1 so we are skipping j and then all together to till x minus uh, 9 right uh, the value of this polynomial will be zero for all x uh, between, uh, you know, for all integer. So when x belongs to the set from zero, one, all the way to j minus one, then j plus one, and then up to nine, right? If you take any uh, element from this uh, set, you have precisely one multiplier that uh, will cause uh, the polynomial. Uh, so this say, let's call this polynomial polynomial Rj of x. So we see that Rj of x is equal zero uh, for x as above, right? When, but is now the problem is that when x is equal to j, this will be some large non-zero value, and what we would like it, we would like it to be one, right? So uh, we divide, for that reason, we define this polynomial, let's call it Q, qj, that is just rj of x divided by all of these values, uh, uh, j minus 0, j minus 1, and then j minus j minus 1, uh, and then j minus j plus 1, all together up to j minus 9. Now, with this polynomial, right, this is just a constant on the bottom. This will be still zero for precisely these values, but when x is equal to j, so qj of x, qj of x evaluated at j will be precisely equal to one, right? So if we have these values uh, b0 up to bn, we construct these polynomials uh, q0 of x up to, sorry here, say b9, up to q9 of x that are zero for all values except for the corresponding value, right? So we have a, a qj of uh, any i uh, is equal to zero if uh, i is not equal to j, and qj of i is equal to 1 if uh, i is equal to j, right? So these polynomials are like switches. They are 0 for all values between 0 and 9, except one particular value that they are indexed with, uh, which they are equal to 1. And now it's clear that the sum, so our polynomial Q of X is equal to the sum uh, QJ of X times BJ, right, when J goes uh, from zero to nine. Huh? 
right? So what is the idea? All these QJs uh, will be zero for all i's not equal to j. So this will be zero except when x is equal to QJ. Uh, when x is equal to QJ, this will be one, and you get precisely value bj. Yeah? So that's a simple trick. It's called the Lagrange interpolation polynomial because what it allows you, it allows you to um, find without essentially without any computation. If I give you uh, ten values, for example. I give you 10 values, <coughs> say here is my axis, and the values are 0, 1, 2, up to 9, right? And if I give you any values B0, say <coughs> B1, uh, B2, all the way to say B9, then this polynomial, right, that we had uh, this polynomial here, or in expanded version, just this polynomial Q of X, will have the property that will thread precisely uh, through this uh, through this given matrix, so, right? So now let's go back to our decoding, right? So we have our 12 values, B0 up to B11. And we know that at most one of them is wrong. And we want somehow, even though one of them is wrong, we want to decode the original sequence of coefficients A0 up to A9 that was assigned. And this is how we do it. Out of these 11 values, we try all possible setting aside here, say, pj. And then you have here all together 11 values. Then out of these 11 values, you pick just arbitrary 10 values, right? You pick arbitrary 10 values, you construct this polynomial, and you evaluate it at the remaining value, right? And you see whether uh, this uh, value is uh, uh, satisfies the same polynomial or not, right? Because at most one of these guys is, uh, is, has been transmitted one. At least 11 guys were trans transmitted correctly. If you put a polynomial through 10 of these values, the 11th value must satisfy the very same polynomial. If it doesn't, it means uh, you took out the correct value and one of the values, wrong values, is here. Right? So this, in this way, right, you understand what the trick is. Uh, right? You have 12 values, one of which is wrong. Uh, you know because that uh, the values that you have are all values of uh, a, uh, uh, an interpolation polynomial right through these uh, um, so uh, remember we transmitted uh, p of 0 up to p of 11 so they are all values uh, they are all values of a single polynomial of degree 9 Right, because the poly polynomial of degree 9 has 10 coefficients. So all these values belong to the same curve. So all what you have to do is 
You see, essentially, the situation is like this. 11 values will be on a curve, the same polynomial, a 12th value, the wrong value, uh, will not fit the same polynomial, right? So you just have to see which are the 11 values that do fit on a polynomial uh, with 10 coefficients of degree 9, right? Um, and this tells you which value is sent in correctly. Now assume, are you with me? You understood this? Um, uh, so assume now that you send, again, you want to send 10 values, but two can get scrambled. The question is, uh, how many values do we have to send by using the same trick to be able uh, to uniquely decode uh, the coefficients of the polynomial? So instead of sending the values that you want to send, you use these values to form a polynomial, and then you send sorry, 12 values of that polynomial. And this allows this uh, decoding. So assume now that uh, uh, two values can be wrong. And let's see maybe sending 13 values, whether this will suffice. Well, we might try the very same trick. So we pick arbitrary 11 values and set aside two values. Um, and then we check if all of these values <coughs> belong to same polynomial. Notice they are redundant. Right, because you have 11 uh, values and polynomial has only 10 coefficients, right? It's of degree nine. So they are redundant, so you can check if you pick these 10 values, any 10 values, you can check whether the extra value is on the same polynomial. And if it is, then these two must be the wrong ones. Unfortunately, this is not the case. Perhaps it's not very likely, but what can happen here? Uh, is it true that if uh, these 11 values all belong to the same curve, the same polynomial of degree 9, uh, is it true that they all have to be correct values? Uh, no. Uh, why is this the case? Well, it might happen that you are really unlucky and that the two wrong values are actually among the chosen ones. And just happens that uh, if you pick 11, sorry, 10 values here and you put the interpolation polynomial it will be the wrong polynomial, but maybe you were unlucky. It just turns out that the second mistake is such that this, for this wrong polynomial, these uh, guys all lie on the same curve. Right? right? So just kind of... So this is not enough. So let's see uh, if we, what happens if we send... Uh, 14 values. So if we send 14 values, then this argument actually starts working because out of these 14 values, I can take 12 and set 2 aside. And then I test, is it the case that all of these 12 values belong to the same curve, the same polynomial of degree 9. Well, <clears throat> if they all belong to the same polynomial of degree 9, every polynomial of degree 9 is uniquely determined by 10 of its values. But here we have 12 values, and at most, two are incorrect which means that 10 values are correct, 
But then the polynomial that these 12 values fit must be the right one, because there is only one polynomial of degree, uh, <coughs> uh, of degree 9 that uh, uh, has, uh, that fits precisely 10 particular values, uh, right? So if you, if you find a polynomial that fits this uh, uh, selection of values, it must be the right polynomial, and voila, you can decode the message. It's easy to see by very sim similar, the very same argument, that uh, if you want to send uh, n numbers, uh, and you, your communication noise in the communication channel is such that e, at most e of them, with some significant, you know, sufficiently large probability, can be wrong, right? Then it's enough to send n plus e, uh, sorry, n plus two e values, right? Such that we can uniquely uh, determine uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, n sent values. We simply form a polynomial of degree n minus 1 that is uniquely determined by n values, right? And then we simply do the following, we set aside e many values and check whether these n plus e values all belong to the same polynomial. If they do, that must be the right polynomial. Why? Because out of these n plus e values, at most e's are incorrect of them, which means that at least n values will be correct but every polynomial of degree n minus 1 is uniquely uh, determined by uh, n values. And thus, it has to be the right one. So it, uh, in practice, uh, we send packets of 256 values in order to uh, send, uh, actually we want to send 200 values, we send a packet of 256 values, which allows 28, which is a substantial number, right? It's 10%, uh, more than 10% of the total number of values that you uh, want to send. Uh, so 28 of them can be wrong, yet the received message is in principle uh, Complete dec uh, perfectly decodable. Okay, uh, so now before we continue with error correction codes, how is this related to our initial problem? This is uh, how is gamma i determined? Well, besides monitoring the signal to noise ratio. The receiver also monitors the number of errors that arrive. And if the system can correct, say, 28 errors, it tries to keep the number of errors to about, say, 14. Because then it's very likely that no packet will contain more than 28 <coughs> errors, and 28 errors can be corrected. So if you get just a few, one or two errors, you immediately decrease your target gamma. However, if you see that you are approaching dangerously the limit of 28 errors that you can uh, uh, correct, you increase the requested gamma, right? So uh, the receiver maintains number of errors so this is not enough, right? It computes signal to error, uh, right? But uh, um, you remember it has to compare it with, uh, with gamma, and that gamma uh, is determined, uh, so it tries to maintain a signal to interference error 
close to, I mean, ratio close to gamma, but gamma is determined so that the number of uh, uh, errors is in the comfortable zone. It's say half of maximal numbers uh, that uh, the system can correct. Um, and not, not more and not much less, uh, not much more and not much less than that. Uh, so you see how beautifully uh, different components uh, of a system cooperate, uh, right? Uh, you monitor signal to noise ratio, you monitor the number of errors, uh, you compute your target, uh, and then you change the transmit power so that this is close to the gamma that is such that, say, approximately uh, half of the maximal uh, number of errors uh, occurs. Uh, so, it looks like this solves the problem, but not quite. This algorithm is uh, called uh, Reed Solomon algorithm, and it was used uh, for a long time for deep space communication, right? I mean, imagine this probe, uh, what is its name, uh, that is now the left solar system. Uh, it's uh, Voyager, was it? Uh, uh, yeah, so it has uh, uh, power, transmit power of just a few watts. And it is uh, at a <laughs> truly astronomical distance. And it has a direct dish. Uh, and you have to receive something that was transmitted with a few watts power, like your cell phone. Uh, imagine signal from your cell phone has to be received uh, uh, from, uh, from outside of the solar system, just how challenging that is. Uh, well, so uh, it was, uh, of course, it used uh, a pretty heavy error correction uh, code, but what is the problem with this code? Well, there are two problems that we have to solve. You remember when we did fast multiplication of polynomials uh, uh, in 3, 1, 2, 1. Uh, we also, we multiply two polynomials by finding the values of a polynomial, multiplying the values and then solving for the coefficients. But what was the problem before, why did we introduce FFP? What is the problem with these guys? Well, look, P0, P1, P11. What is P11? It is A9 times 11 to the power 9. So, and 